Yes, hello. Um, I am Ida Hajivayanis. I am the Swahili lecturer at uh, SOAS. So welcome to the sixth event in the SOAS University of London. Uh, I'm continuing the conversation series. Um, SOAS will be hosting more virtual events in the upcoming months. And uh, okay, today's event will be recorded. Please use the following hashtags to discuss or follow this event. So hashtag SOAS, hashtag SOAS alumni, and hashtag we are SOAS. Please tweet as much as you can. You're more than welcome to do that. Uh, so today's event will be connecting the diaspora through African languages. We will have Dr. Montre Misuri uh, and Kumi Olatunji. We will have a discussion for about 30 minutes, uh, followed by a Q&A. Please submit your questions in the chat box. Uh, SOAS offers courses in Amharic, in Hausa, Somali, Swahili, Yoruba, Zulu, and um, I mean, we, we will also share all this in the, in the chat box. My personal expertise is Swahili language and, and translation, although I'm very interested in the diaspora. Um, uh, indeed, um, I, I mean, this has been very well documented that uh, second generation diasporans tend to feel disconnected from what should be their culture. Uh, this is also the case for Swahili diaspora in the UK. Uh, so I found, for example, when you go to funerals or, or weddings, the, the second generation tend to be a, a bit lost sometimes. So they, they need explanations about things. And also I'm a mother. I'm a mother to four second generation children. And I also see this firsthand. Uh, but interestingly here at SOAS, we're getting more and more heritage learners. So these are learners who, who hear the language when they're at home. And I, I think it definitely shows that there is an interest in, um, in, 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 in the culture of the parents, so, so to say. Um, so now, uh, as in like, how might education policy or maybe curricula best support this desire that is, that is there, the desire to reconnect? Uh, so we should hear more about this from our speakers today. And uh, so Dr. Montre Missouri is an associate professor in film and director of the graduate film program in the Department of Media, Journalism and Film, where she teaches script writing, film directing, and African cinema. Uh, Dr. Missouri has worked in uh, England, in Northern Ireland, Ghana, Nigeria as an independent uh, filmmaker. Kumi Olatunji is a linguist and language enthusiast. She spent several years learning French, Spanish, Mandarin, and, and Japanese, and she has extensive experience teaching English as a foreign language. She turned her professional attention to her heritage language of Yoruba while at SOAS on her MA linguistics program, and she wrote her dissertation on the family practices which have continued to be, um, continued to, um, to a shift away from the language use. So now we will start with Kumi Olatunji, who will give us a perspective of the Yoruba and, and the language use in diaspora. Welcome, Kumi. Um, thank you, um, Ida, Ida that's uh, a very generous uh, <laughs> um, introduction. Um, so yeah, I guess, uh, I don't know, it might be a big task for me to give the experience, the, uh, sort of the layout of all Yoruba in the diaspora in the UK, but I can talk about uh, my experience and I can talk about the experience of the people I spoke to on my dissertation. Um, I mean, essentially, it sounds like it's very similar to Swahili in that um, I consider myself sort of the second generation, so a child of somebody who emigrated, left um, Nigeria and uh, settled here, stayed here. And I grew up listening to the language, hearing it, being spoken to it by my mom and uh, extended family members, um, but not really engaging with it so much. I mean, my mom, who is an audience actually, um, she did say that I used to speak it um, in certain occasions, uh, for example, to uncles who uh, didn't speak to me in English. Um, but I was, uh, I don't know, I just didn't use it for most of my um, communication practices, right? And when I spoke to my participants um, in, for my uh, MA dissertation, it was the same kind of thing. Uh, we understand it when we're spoken to, but we just don't respond in Yoruba. Um, so 
I think that's that's a, a general idea of uh, the state of yoga in the UK. Obviously, there will be exceptions, and there are exceptions which I've seen on social media, and we kind of really applaud those second generation who, who are actually speaking it, and we're like, oh my gosh, wow, how did that happen? Which I guess is just, I guess it's the exception that proves the rule, isn't it? That um, uh, that we kind of shifted away, uh, that we've lost our language to some degree, and maybe in, in that lost culture a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, that was, those are my initial uh, findings and, and also my experience, uh, yeah. Okay, well, that's, that's very interesting. Um, how about, okay, Montre, uh, would you like to let us know, I mean, your thoughts and your okay, perspective on the issue? Okay. Uh, thank you. So uh, first off, I just wanted to add uh, a thank you again for the introduction. I just wanted to add to that, that um, I'm on faculty at Howard University uh, here in Washington, D.C. So I'm coming in to you all from uh, from the U.S. Uh, and um, like Komi, I am um, an alum of uh, SOAS University of London, where I completed my Ph.D. in film and media studies. So I'm coming from a, a slightly different perspective. Um, I am not a linguist. As I said, my area um, is filmmaking and film studies. And my research in terms of um, research beyond the creative realm is on representations of uh, the Yoruba Atlantic identity or the Yoruba Atlantic experience in um, an African-American film as well as um, other film makers uh, within um, the Western Hemisphere. Uh, so I do look at uh, Caribbean cinema, um, Latin cinema, and how uh, Yoruba Atlantic, uh, what I would refer to, and I'm borrowing, but Yoruba Atlantic identity is used as a kind of shared cultural language between diverse people. So I am um, I am definitely part of the African diaspora as an African American. I am uh, part of that uh, history of the transatlantic slave trade, um, not of uh, any direct Nigerian heritage that I know of, um, but um, in terms of Yoruba Atlantic culture and specifically Yoruba religion, uh, it has a, a place within the African American experience in terms of music, uh, film, art, and so that's uh, my focal point as far as my research is how Yoruba diaspora culture has been adopted. Some will say retention. I, I think it's something to be said that it could very well be more along the lines of an adoption, particularly of African American cultures adopting that which has been um, brought to us by uh, a Latino community, a Caribbean community, and their retentions that they have brought to the United States. And we as African Americans have, um, have adopted and have connected to as a way of reclaiming our own African roots. So that, that's my research focus. That's what I even um, interweave in my classes here at Howard University. Okay. That's very interesting. That's, okay. Thank you very much for that. So, I mean, how do you both see this reconnection? Maybe if you could talk about that. How, how do you see this re reconnection, say, through art? And um, I mean, how have you seen it? Think, yeah. Maybe Kumi, you could start by telling us that. Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, again, I can talk about myself personally, but I also uh, sort of refer to what I, I, um, I discovered or what the participants, when I interviewed them, what they were saying. So uh, for me, um, I always tell a little anecdote, and I'm sure some of the people who know me, if they're here, will be like, oh, we've heard this before. But um, I was working in Spain teaching English, and um, I was on the phone to my mom, and she was asking me, like, oh, how, how's your Spanish coming along, uh, in light of the fact that I'm spending a lot of time speaking English. And I was like, yeah, it's good, it's fine, you know, I'm, I'm putting in the work. And then she was like, oh, what about your Yoruba? I like Yoruba and Koh. And I was just like, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Um, she's like, OK, uh, say something. And the first thing that escaped my mouth was actually uh, Spanish. So I was really shocked by that, so much so that it was about five, more than five years ago, maybe eight years ago now. And I still remember it, because it really stuck with me, like, oh my gosh, this uh, 
uh, foreign language is kind of taking this space that should be the preserve of like her heritage, culture. Um, obviously, I didn't have those words then, but that's the language I'm using now. And I was just like, oh, this isn't, this isn't right. So um, I kind of held that uh, experience um, in my memory and in my mind and thought, you know what, I need to do something about this. I need to make sure that there's a space carved out for heritage, for culture, um, for a connection to that. And I, I think it can be done through language. So that was definitely part of the reason why I decided to study at SOAS, actually, because there is a Yoruba, there's a Yoruba language course available. Um, so uh, yeah, when thinking about doing further study, I was just like, cool, SOAS is the place, because I know they do this, this is what I want to do, this is important. Uh, I didn't have it in my mind that I would be focusing on Yoruba as sort of any, in any professional capacity. I just wanted to learn the language and you know, do my linguistics degree and carry on teaching English to the rest of the world. But then that was a complete shift um, in, uh, in my perspective as a result of sort of being at SOAS and, and doing this research as well. Um, and also, I think um, speaking to the people I did for, for the, the, the dissertation, um, a lot of them have that same view that like we need to connect or reconnect, I guess, um, from this kind of detachment that happened growing up in the UK, from what it is to be Yoruba, what it is to be Nigerian, because of the context in which we were growing up, you know, it was like the 80s, I mean, I'm in my 30s, so the 80s, maybe some of them uh, 70s and also uh, 90s, um, where, you know, you know, British racism, um, anti-immigrant sentiments, um, even just being African was just, you could be Caribbean, that's okay, it's palatable, right? Um, you're kind of cool, everybody likes Bob Marley, but being African is just, it was just really divided, so, we were growing up with all of that internalized, uh, I guess, self-hatred in a way. Um, some, again, not all, but it's definitely something that came out of the, the research I did. Um, and so now, in the context of Burner Boy, Afrobeat, like the surgeons for Afrobeat, um, where sort of people are writing their Yoruba names with all the accents and the sub dots, myself included, um, Naira, uh, Naira Ma Mali, you know, who's singing, or Naira Mali, who's singing in Yoruba and, you know, on his Instagram, he's talking in Yoruba all the time. He has like maybe five million followers. So in this context, um, it's just maybe it's been the catalyst for a different kind of uh, attitude, sentiment to want to connect with this. What are they saying in these songs? What are they talking about? Oh my gosh, it's actually really cool to present this version of myself. And let me not just perform it, let me actually connect with it. And so then I guess people want to learn the language, um, but then also to then pass it on, you know, to their children, to safeguard heritage for future generations. Um, otherwise, otherwise there is this fear that it could be really lost, right? Um, so I guess that's, that's the sort of the, the role of connection in, in what I've been looking at. Yeah. What about okay. one thing? Oh, wow. Okay, that's a tough act to follow. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so, uh, so I'll, I'll go from one side of the Atlantic to the other because obviously we had discussion um, before today about the the different diasporas. So, um, even though again my perspective is that of the the African American experience, and that's my research area, but part of my um, lived experience, which we talked about, is um, living for more than a decade in London, in the UK, and kind of um, very grateful to have been adopted by the Nigerian community and specifically by Yoruba um, in terms of those who, who were born and raised in Yoruba land, Nigeria, as well as um, the first generation that, uh, that Kumi talked about as far as being born in London and having that unique experience of being of African parents. Um, but being born and raised in the UK. So uh, I too am a proud mom. I have three kids, all of whom are half Yoruba. I'm, I have twins, so Ibeji, uh, and they they are, have, are kind of in the middle as well because they were born in South London, but um, are now calling the US home. Um, so I, I'm thinking, I'm always thinking in terms of these, these different diasporas because I see both sides having um, even as an adult, um, seeing the experience of what it is to be um, of African parents in the UK. Um, but in terms of uh, my research and thinking about 
uh, the significance of a Yoruba Atlantic cultural identity in the Americas. Um, as I mentioned before, the connection of these various diasporas throughout the Americas, as far as Latin America and the Caribbean, I think part of um, the push for African Americans to um, to adopt and to uh, become focused on representations of a Yoruba Atlantic identity is has very strong um, both social and political uh, implications. So uh, the idea that these various people are coming with these um, seemingly disconnected identities, that even though a person can be coming from Cuba or the Dominican Republic or Haiti or um, some other part of uh, South America, and even though we as SOAS and other in academic institutions understand the clear connection between these communities as far as of African descent and African Americans, living here in the United States, that's not always obvious. So we can just think about the election that we just lived through and how we have these different groups or pockets of uh, the voting population making very different decisions, I think to an extent based on the idea that they are not in, at all connected. Um, and so when you see when there's this um, adoption of, say, again, Yoruba Atlantic identity and a history that goes with that, and religion and culture, then that becomes the basis by which conversation begin. Uh, so again, anecdotally, um, being, again, Black American and thinking about, say, seeing uh, someone who's Latino or Latina, even if we look the same, physically, we're not the same or at least that's the perception socially, politically within this space. So you are a Spanish speaker or your parents are Spanish speakers and I'm not like you because my parents migrated to the U.S. for economic reasons and it, does, it was not about having some kind of political solidarity with your experience of being the descendant of enslaved people in the United States. I, I don't want to be economically or socially position where you are. That's not what, why we come to this country. But then as we connect, if I can mention on Orisha, <laughs> if you say, okay, well, uh, what about, do you know anything about Oshun or Yumoja? Now all of a sudden we can talk <laughs> because it, it, I've, I've become, instead of an outsider, I'm now an insider. Now the conversation can begin because I've proven myself to have some kind of uh, deeper cultural understanding of that community's experience. And so it's interesting that, again, you have these groups of people who have, are coming from different language groups and from different parts of, of the Americas, but a, a starting point of a conversation to then build some kind of connections or social, political uh, solidarity can be with this cultural experience that finds its way or comes from southwestern Nigeria. So that is in my perspective in thinking about how do we look at, in terms of film, for example, how we look at Cuban third cinema, Brazilian cinema, other cinemas um, throughout this part of the world, and then how those cinemas influence African American independent filmmaking around this idea of representations of Yoruba culture and religion. I hope that's helpful. And we see this again in art as well, like uh, we talked about before today. Um, people have mentioned my work in um, thinking about uh, or doing an analysis on, say, Beyonce's uh, visual album Lemonade or in terms of fashion, um, music, again, how is a Yoruba diaspora culture and specifically religion used and adopted by African Americans as a way of linking our historical experience to those of other diaspora communities within this hemisphere. Can I just very quickly uh, sort of like ask something? You, you've mentioned a couple of times um, is it a Yoruba Atlantic? So is there a difference between okay, Yoruba Atlantic and is it Yoruba UK, like Yoruba Britain? I mean, um, yes, yeah, so, so, so what's the difference? 
Homie, I'm going to jump in, but please, you know, correct me. Yes, <laughs> please. Uh, I mean, you guys go on and, 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 and converse, yeah. Well, again, I, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of um, obviously my, my experience, lived experience of being African-American, but then also a lived experience of um, being um, amongst Yoruba, the Nigerian community, specifically the Yoruba community in the UK, it's a difference in the diasporas in terms of, you know, the roots and the the motivation for um, for the diaspora experience. So the reason why I'm making a distinction in terms of the Yoruba Atlantic, meaning the Americas, is I'm talking about the historical um, experience of those who are the descendants of the transatlantic slave trade. Oh, as okay. opposed to, and I'm going to make a distinction, and I, uh, there's another, there's probably like three that I asked for. So there's, when, when we're in the Americas, we act as if, again, as if Africans did not travel, West Africans in particular did not travel after 1960 and onward. So a very kind of Euro-American centric idea of the Black diaspora, the African diaspora, is almost strictly this kind of the transatlantic slave trade. So that's one, and I'm not giving it any kind of hierarchy. Or, but and then the other, of course, what obviously Kumi is talking about is in terms of the experience of those children whose parents, for socioeconomic reasons, they're economic migrants, maybe the educational migrants, they came to UK to study, and then they stayed, and they got jobs and had kids, and then their children were born in the UK. And then that's a, that is a different diaspora experience. And then there's a similar one still here in North America. And it's interesting because now I'm talking about kind of my own children and even my students at Howard University of uh, those um, who are the, the children of Nigerians who did not go to the UK and instead they settled in the United States or Canada. I would argue there are similarities between their experience of being born and raised in Detroit, Michigan, or Atlanta, Georgia, or Washington, D.C., they have a, a lot of similarities um, with their cousins in the U.K., and then they also have differences. So I think uh, the obvious connection, again, is that they are the children of parents for whatever educational or economic or what social reasons decided probably from like 1959, 1960 onward to leave Nigeria. And I know we some we can call that the brain drain and settle in the UK or Canada or the US. So that idea, that kind of outsider experience of all the things that Kumi talked about in terms of this mainstream perception of a stereotypical and very negative derogatory idea of what it is to be African in the West. And not only how, um, how the white mainstream society treats you, but even how other black diaspora groups treat you. So when you were talking about, okay, what it is to be uh, Caribbean in the UK is a bit different than what it is to be um, to be of African parents in the UK. So for my students, again thinking about this other diaspora, it's what is it to be African in the US versus what it is to be Black American or as we say African American in the US and that distinction. Now I think that is similar. The difference um, that I would see between children of Nigerian parents in the U.S. versus children of Nigerian parents in the U.K. is this, even though we have this, this very um, significant Caribbean um, culture and community and, you know, like, you can be just a straight, you know, a straight up guy from Birmingham who's of, you know, English parents or Irish parents, but you speak Patois. Like, you know that there's very strong Caribbean kind of influence throughout England and other parts of the UK. But I, I, I think it's even stronger an influence in the US in terms of the black American experience. The, I mean, we're like 12 or 13% of the population. We think we're even bigger in terms of how we kind of dominate certain spaces. So I think that children of Nigerian parents in the US, they are still a distinct group 
because they share similarities with those in the UK. But then there's that kind of um, almost forced in some ways uh, adoption of a more dominant African American identity and culture, politically, socially, creatively, artistically. Like I'm black in America, so if I'm black in America, I have to be this kind of black in America. Now, in terms of again the idea about the parents speaking Yoruba and the, a lot of things that Komi you talked about, I think those similarities are there. But then there's that additional thing of uh, of assimilating into the dominant black culture. Okay. Yeah, go on, Komi. I mean, tell us what you think. Yes. Yeah, it's quite interesting because um, that idea of um, everybody who's black and American is an African American. Um, I think uh, I was even. I've only recently begun to realize that that's not the case. And that's through uh, sort of meeting and hanging out with and being friends with people who are, uh, yeah, American, raised in, uh, in the US, but having uh, parents from whatever, either, whether it is the Caribbean or uh, African countries. And sort of that dichotomy that is basically white or, you know, uh, blanketed over um, is quite interesting from the outside. I'm looking in from the outside and it's almost, uh, understandable <laughs> to me um, like well you have an American accent you're black therefore you must be African American um, but then I, I have also started to notice the similarities I guess between someone like myself who's born and raised in the UK Nigerian parents and someone who's born and raised in the US but maybe with Asian parents um, but I guess uh, what do you um, see as maybe the the relationship between the uh, African Americans and the I guess other hyphenate Americans, but black um, in the U.S. Um, in terms of a relationship to their culture, maybe even to Europe, because uh, I know that when I was doing some reading on heritage language learning, a lot of African Americans try to uh, learn Yoruba as a way to connect with, I guess, this transatlantic uh, identity or African identity, Yoruba identity. Um, but at the same time, I guess maybe they, I don't know if they see themselves as very distinct from somebody who is Yoruba American, like but but then they're trying to learn Yoruba. Do you, do you understand that? Yeah, definitely. Yes. Yeah. Um, so then, how about art? Is in like art and film? We've got five minutes to go, or six, I think. So how does art? Uh, I mean, come into play with all this, like. Um, what happened with art and artists? Like, I think we talked about Beyonce and, and is it Barna Boy and Naira Male? I mean, how do they come into play with all this? Well, um, I think they're, obviously I think they're influencers and um, and I know we're supposed to move on to art, but but I feel like I want to answer. <laughs> please, please do, 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 do. So it's, so it's do. interesting as I'm looking at the, the two of you all and you're right because just literally uh, Swahili and Yoruba are probably, Swahili being first, are probably the two most um, sought after languages uh, for that, that people want to learn in terms of African languages, um, I think in the US. I, I could be wrong, but I don't think so. I think Swahili being yeah. first and Yoruba is probably a close second. And so to answer, um, I think to speak to your question, Komi, it's uh, probably one again of uh, searching for identity. So to, to a certain extent, uh, from the perspective, I use the term Black American, but that seems at times problematic because now the technical term is African American. But it is just even the the term is Af African American is odd. It's kind of a weird, problematic, or you know, uh, contested terminology because it, we got into a situation where Obama was not African-American, but I'm African-American, but his father was from Kenya. So uh, so it's thinking about what is the political history and even a term like African-American. So um, I, I one of the things that stood out for me being black American living in the UK is the idea that people are coming with these um, identities that are, are a bit more fixed. I mean, there's fluidity to it, but I think when you're asking, okay, well, how do pe how does a Black American make a distinction between himself or herself and a Nigerian American? I think that's what we're saying. Well, like we're identifying the place of the yes. parents and then hyphen American. And I think it's 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 slightly different in the sense that the the 
shared experience of the Black American or the African American is the idea of not knowing where you come from on the continent. So it's kind of odd, like, well, how do you see yourself as being distinctive? Well, I, I, if I see myself as being distinctive is that my mother was born in Georgia and my father was born in West Virginia, and don't ask me anything beyond that, right? <laughs> like, that's it. You know, I'm not taking a DNA test. So, yeah, so I'm from Washington, D.C. I was born and raised in Washington, D.C. I can tell you I've lived in Nigeria, I've lived in Ghana, I've lived in the U.K., but my identity is very American, for better or for worse, because that is the shared experience of being a descendant of slaves and the entire history being wiped out. So the attraction to say Yoruba is the idea of this is something that can kind of put me, find a home culturally to say, this is whether that's where my DNA leads me or not, this is home. The, the, the Yoruba Southwestern Nigeria. That helps us. I don't know, yeah. but I think that does still feed into art. Then that becomes the, the inspiration for how to infuse that history and that culture into music, into uh, visual arts, into film. I think that that's an inspiration to then again have something to latch onto and hold onto. Yeah, go on, Kumi. You're gonna say something as well. So let let me hear. Let's hear. Um, I guess if we're moving on to art, um, yeah, no, I think, um, well, before we do that, but yeah, when you say it makes a lot of sense, um, I guess in context, I'm just kind of finding out these things as I go. Um, but yeah. Um, so in terms of, I guess, art and the, the influence of art on uh, Yoruba, on art and, and music and things, and maybe it's relevant to what I'm interested in. I mean, I briefly spoke about it before where, you know, you see, um, Yoruba on your screens. I recently watched a film um, called The Last Tree. It was played in 2019, maybe just last year. Or it's quite a recent film. It's sort of a coming of age of um, a young Yoruba boy who um, was fostered and then has, goes back and lives with, live with his mom and, you know, ends up in Nigeria. It's a beautiful, uh, beautiful, beautiful film. Um, but seeing something like that, the representation, and I felt it was a really authentic representation of not just being black, you know, it's, it's actually specifically Yoruba culture. I guess it speaks to me, and I'm, I'm assuming it speaks to the masses because, you know, films like this are doing okay um, in, a, in a very personal uh, personal level. Um, so, you know, I felt like, a, a, I guess, a swelling sense of pride when he decided to go to Nigeria and he loved it. And he even goes to, um, the protagonist goes to a Babalao. Um, and has uh, a ceremony, you know, uh, done. I'm just like, oh wow, because normally the images of, um, I guess, Nigerianists are uh, sort of religious or Christian, uh, sorry, uh, Euro, yeah, Christian religion or um, Islam. And so to see sort of the indigenous aspect of them, I'm just like, oh wow, we're showing this now. Okay, cool. Let me let me know more. Let me see more. Let me find out what that is. I didn't know already. Um, I mentioned the musicians as well, obviously hearing the Yoruba, it's just like, oh my God, I can actually understand what they're saying. It's kind of like, a, like an in an in crowd um, feeling, but <laughs> the, the stage is like basically for everyone. The whole world knows who uh, Bernard Boy is, the whole world knows, um, even not just uh, Yoruba, but when Beyonce samples Chimamanda on her, um, on her uh, record, it's just like, oh wow, I know who this woman is and she's a Nigerian woman. So uh, yeah, these things just, there's sort of a personal connection, talking about connection that you can identify with. And then I guess it spurs people on to want to know more, want to be part of it. And um, yeah, it makes for interesting research. <laughs> that's, that's really good. So let me ask you one last thing. Okay, do you think then that there, there could be some kind of like a, of a global um, Yoruba diaspora identity? Is, is there such a thing? I think there is. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think, I think so. um, that's that's I think uh, kind of where the title of this talk um, even originated from. So um, the idea of mapping the Yoruba was um, a project that I was in discussion with uh, with a colleague and friend who actually teaches at SOAS and uh, teaches Yoruba language and culture, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Ricola. Ricola. Yes, and so we talked in terms of uh, the idea 
that there is a where I'm starting the conversation with the, the concept of a Yoruba Atlantic identity that my real interest uh, is further in thinking about a global identity uh, and even though it can have layers and different roots or paths to get there but uh, this notion that and which we didn't talk about but even throughout West Africa uh, that there are different cultural groups within the region who, even though they don't identify themselves as Yoruba, but they have this shared heritage, this shared uh, story, or if you call it folklore, that talks in terms of their migration from Ile Ife to wherever they've settled. So whether it's the Gan of Accra or the Ewe of, um, of Togo and of uh, Ghana or the various groups in Benin, but even the diaspora, because we don't think about that, but the diaspora within a region of the continent, the shared heritage and the shared um, culture, the calling different deities by the same names that they are still referred to in southwestern Nigeria. The most prominent, of course, being with Eshu and Lekwa. So, um, so that diaspora, and then thinking in terms of the transatlantic diaspora with regards to enslavement, and what we've talked about in detail, again, then that third wave of diaspora with regards to those who voluntarily migrated and settled in the UK or North America. I think when you start to broaden that kind of scope of just the sheer magnitude of people, and then in terms of art, whether it's film, um, and thank you for mentioning the last tree, because I'm, I'm sure that Shola Amu, in my own work in DC, we've hosted um, um, some of his work, and so like he's an amazing filmmaker. Uh, but if we think in terms of film, literature, uh, visual art, music, again, I'm thinking as far as fashion, all of this, I think it's, um, there's an argument to be made about a global identity. and. What I had had in mind was the idea of a digital mapping, a digital cultural mapping of uh, the influence of Yoruba on all of these different parts of the continent, as well as uh, other spaces beyond the Americas, Africa, UK, and Europe. But even again, being a SOAS graduate, thinking about linguistic connections between Yoruba and Japanese, like what are these broader kind of perspectives that we can think in terms of influences and connections. Okay, that was, that was very, very good. So uh, we, I think we have to take some questions now. And um, the first one comes from Vanessa Power. And uh, she wants to ask, she, okay, she's saying that she has spent many, many years living in and working in the southern part of Nigeria. And she's asking, um, in as much as the Yoruba language is lost in this global space of foreign languages, would you agree that it dominates the space of language and culture within Nigeria? So, for instance, she says you mentioned Barnaboy in your reference, but he is actually from River State in the south region, but sings in Yoruba. So yes, go on. So you're both nodding. Uh, who wants to respond to Vanessa Power? Um, yeah, I can start, I don't mind. So um, yeah. I think it's interesting uh, whether or not it dominates the space of language and culture within Nigeria. I don't know if I can speak to that um, because hey, I'm not in Nigeria. And also I'm, I'm generally referencing um, the effects of, uh, I guess, Yoruba in the UK. You know, or, or language um, language loss in the UK, and I would agree that there is a way that Yoruba does dominate uh, conversations on Africanness. Uh, sometimes West Africanness. I mean, uh, uh, Montre just told us that Swahili and Yoruba are the two most learned languages by African Americans. So why, you know, um, why are they not learning um, Igbo or uh, Efik? Um, so yeah, it does dominate, but whether it dominates in Nigeria, I think maybe Vanessa, you, if you, you know, had the experience of living and working there, you would, you would be able to speak to that better. Probably, but I'm guessing Berna Boy, he's trying to um, market himself to this global, on the global uh, stage, not just in Yoruba. So, sorry, not just in Nigeria. So I guess, yeah, Yoruba does dominate on, on the global uh, stage for African languages, but. I mean, 
maybe we have to discuss things like who has power, social power, economic power, political power in Nigeria to, to see whether or not that's actually uh, the case, you know? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Maybe, maybe um, I, the, the next question can go to, to Montre, which is uh, from uh, Tet Coffee, and uh, they're asking, what's the future of African language? As language is, is such a powerful identifier and means of engagement and establishing identity, so would you suggest, for example, one, to have a continental African language that is taught in all the schools, say, in Africa and abroad, or should we establish one regional language for all the four corners of Africa, uh, again, taught in schools and abroad? And uh, Tet speaks three African languages fluently and from Ghana. So should we have one? This is probably the idea of a pan-African language. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> do you have any thought on, 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 on a pan-African language? Or is that going to erase everybody's language and, and, and identity as well? I'm not sure. And you want me to answer that? <laughs> um, well, again, I, I preface my answer as um, not, not a linguist. I'm, I'm not a linguist, but um, to see how that could be, that could be a bit problematic in the sense, as we know that language is culture. So what cultures are being lost um, if we just, if we make a decision on just a few languages, um, being dominant across the whole continent that that seems i'm not sure how that would work so because there's so many languages and so many even again not a linguist but even in terms of yoruba we know that when we say yoruba we're talking about one particular quote dialect of it we are not talking about all the many different ways that yoruba is spoken even within this the southwestern region of nigeria um, I think that probably. I think you're probably yeah. right. This this probably transcends. Yeah. yeah. But this is a good question from Adele, and uh, she's asking about trans transatlantic diaspora and access, and she says that she's noticed that Black America and Pan Africanism, so yes, generally tends to to to, to adopt Swahili as the heritage language. So this is seen as. So for example, we have Kwanzaa that have taken Swahili. So how can descendants of transatlantic slavery engage with heritage without drifting into appropriation? Okay, that, that's one I feel more comfortable with. Uh, <laughs> so great, yeah, that's a really good question. I think that, um, it, yeah. that, that one way uh, to approach that is really to uh, think in terms of the specifics of, of culture. So uh, I agree with the question, again, living, growing up in not just the U.S., but in Washington, D.C., where when I was young, we actually adopted, not me, but our city adopted Afrocentricity as our citywide public school uh, curricula. So, and uh, being a graduate even of, of Howard University, um, I think there was a, a lot more that I, I needed to see, and I'm grateful that I did see by leaving the U.S. and um, first of all settling in the U.K. and then um, living and working in West Africa. I, I believe it gives you a totally, from my Black American uh, perspective, it gives you a totally different understanding of the just multiplicity of Black identities and um, how we as, as, um, as African American uh, see the diaspora um, sometimes can be quite reductionist when we think about Afrocentricity, you know, uh, in terms of adopting Swahili, but then there's this thing we created called Kwanzaa. And so we, we have pieced together this quilt or this gumbo that serves our social and political purposes, and we've taken different bits from the continent and kind of mushed it all together for what it is the negotiation we're doing here in the U.S., that does not necessarily mean that it translates well in terms of our interactions and our understandings of um, those who are born and raised on the continent, nor does it, um, does it translate well to those who are um, in the diaspora and are of African parentage. So to have real one-on-one -on -one dialogue and interaction and be open to the understanding that our sense of blackness and our black identity is not the universal black identities. 
That's that's a really that's a really great answer, definitely. And uh, there's a okay, Doctor Kole here, who's a to Kole Odutola, who's just told us that it was actually Professor Wallace Soyinka who suggested that the Pan Pan African language should be Swahili in 1977. There's there's another really good question from um, uh, about Brazil uh, from Moji Moji, and they're asking. Um, would you be able to say maybe something more about the Yoruba culture experience or influence or in Brazil? Uh, because they find it fascinating how uh, much of the culture has survived slavery. But this is also linked to somebody else who's just written that there's a whole museum. So Agustina says that, uh, okay, they were in Cuba and there's an entire museum that is dedicated to Yoruba religion. So you've but uh, this happening in Cuba, the museum, um, would you tell them more about um, uh, Brazil, if you can? But if you can't, we can just move on. <laughs> so I, I'll jump in. So, and I, I'll only speak a little bit because I'm not an expert on Cuba, but obviously part of my research in terms of film um, yeah. touched on those areas. Um, one thing, and it's, 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 I think part of, um, the retention, um, and this does sound very Afrocentric, so I'm treading very lightly, but I think part of the retention is a distinction between, again, say a Brazil or a Cuba versus the United States is uh, one, Catholicism, uh, and two, um, gosh, this sounds so Afrocentric, the drum. So <laughs> drum, the talking drum, um, is I, I think is a, a big um, is a big distinction between again the U.S. and other parts of the Americas in the sense that the drum as we know speaks the language. So in the in various parts of the Americas, both the the ability to maintain the drum among enslaved peoples and to have a religion that has multi deities that then becomes a space by which but Orishas can still live and breathe and exist within the minds and the experiences of those peoples. Um, I think historically is where there's a distinction. Someone's mentioned Fidel Castro, and yes, and then I was what I was talking about. <laughs> it was that, the same I, with Dr. Yes, Kole Odutala who's yes, been telling us right. quite a lot of yes, Thank you, Dr. Right. And that is, and then there is the political implications. So I think it's Cuba in particular is interesting because even though we're thinking about the revolution, the 1959 revolution with Castro and the introduction of socialism, which is obviously coming from a neo-Marxist point of view, but we have this, this very unique space that even though uh, there's the push for socialism as a form of, uh, of a class revolution, the, the, the retention and the promotion of Yoruba then becomes formed the, the cultural basis for a national identity. It's a rallying cry. I'm sure the person asking this question is well aware, again, of the 31st of December and the famous televised speech by Castro when these two white doves come from the sky in the middle of the night. And that was by the people of Cuba considered uh, the anointment of Fidel Castro, that he, whether you believe it was Oshun or it's Obatala, uh, either way, that this was a symbol recognized by so many Cuban people that Castro himself had been ordained by the Yoruba Rishas to be the leader of the Cuban people. So I think whether you're looking at Cuba, which is quite distinctive, but even Brazil, that you have these very diverse people coming from all these different backgrounds. They do not necessarily have a shared um, uh, racial or cultural history, but if you can say to a people like the Brazilian nation that, oh, but all of you all understand that Yamaja is your mother. So whether you're Japanese, Brazilian, or you're of German descent and you're Brazilian, but the 31st of December, this is the feast of Yamaja or any other female deities or a plethora of Yoruba Orishas, that then becomes the, the cultural basis for, formate, for formulating uh, national identity. So it does have social and political implications. Hope that answers okay. that's, that's, that. That was, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. There's a question here from uh, Dr. Teresa Poeta 
who is lecturer at University of Edinburgh, and she wants to know, um, what do you think about the role or the effect of universities in teaching a language or not teaching it uh, for diasporas in various contexts that you have experienced? Maybe that's quite a good question to end with because we have three minutes to go, I think. <laughs> well, we might, we might, we might, we might, of, we'll see, go on. Yeah. Um, so so I think just look at the role of universities, yeah. Yeah, so I think, um, I guess for what we term heritage language uh, languages, um, the university, I think uh, the education of these heritage languages or community languages, community languages tends to happen in uh, maybe two domains. Uh, one is the university and the other is the community, you know, um, so started by uh, speakers of the language who feel like, hey, we should do something for our community. And so they set up either complementary schools or, um, I don't know, initiatives like uh, Culture Tree, where, you know, they have uh, YouTube videos to teach uh, kids songs and parents can join in, right? Um, and universities, they have a, a, a part to play as well because, I mean, there is no community. Uh, community school for Yoruba, really. Um, not not uh, in the same way that I can go and get formal uh, training um, that will you know, be of a certain level with the, the, the pedagogy that's been thought about and considered. So, um, I mean, it does have a, a place, but unfortunately, I don't think there's very much besides SOAS for Yoruba in the UK, and not just Yoruba, for African languages. I, if I'm not wrong, uh, SOAS is the only place you can study Yoruba, um, maybe Zulu if it's along the curriculum, and some of the other um, less commonly taught African languages other than Swahili, basically. I know Swahili can be taught in, in a lot of the other universities. Um, uh, well, so not if, that much, quite a few, but go oh, on. Well, a lot of the other universities that teach African languages, <laughs> I should say. Um, so I think universities, it would be great for, for them to do, it would be good to do more, which is basically what I'm hoping to kind of look into next. How can there be a sort of a better pedagogy um, or a methodology or approach to teaching specifically heritage learners? Because what we find is that in the in the language, these African language classrooms, they're sort of heritage learner dominant or heavy, uh, if not dominant, but the, the um, sort of, teaching of these languages is so that it takes a second language or foreign language approach. So it doesn't take into the, to consideration that this is not actually something new and unfamiliar necessarily. I'm talking about the curriculum, um, not necessarily what the teacher does with it. The teacher can be great and then, you know, uh, mold that, um, what they have, work with it to adapt to the learner. But um, I generally think that, I don't know, it's not a reflection on university, it's just the current state of uh, African language education, particularly in the UK, I think the US is doing a lot better, but particularly in the UK, and even more yeah. with respect to heritage learners, there's just so much more that can be done. Um, and maybe it's the case of the community speaking to the university, um, or the university going to the community and, you know, triangulating this and finding out how we can work from um, more, more sides. I definitely think that you've really touched on something really important there, Kumi. I think it's very much the university okay, needs to come together with the community, the community and universities that okay, get together, definitely. And uh, Dr. Cole has just said here that African language uni universities tend to be service departments, so we're just offering services of these languages. We definitely need to work with the communities for there to really be more impact in, in what we're teaching. And Yah here has, and has added that uh, obviously cultural immersion is very, very important to language learning. And that's something that, um, I mean, do you have any any, any thoughts on, on cultural immersion and uh, and language? We've already over, we've already gone over our time, I think. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, cultural immersion, so immersing, immersing oneself in the culture. Um, I think you have, it depends where the, the site of learning is both inside and outside of the classroom. So yeah. you could talk about um, bringing culture into the classroom. Yeah, sure. You know, um, maybe using uh, 
these um, popular cultural references that we've spoken about, um, even if Bernabo or whoever is just dropping some Yoruba in songs, I still think that's Yoruba. So we can look at, we can talk about that in the language class. Why, why not? What is the significance of that? Bring culture, not just the learning of language, um, and not just you know this of verbs and uh, and sentence structures. Bring all of that into the classroom. Bring history into the classroom because people are there usually for the heritage, right? So they want to learn about yeah. where they've come from, whether that's an imagined, yeah. thing, imagined myth, mystical Africa, or whether it's like hey, what actually happened in uh, you know 1979, like what, what actually happened. Um, so yeah, bring culture into the classroom, and then why not take take the students outside, go to where there are Yoruba people in the UK, or which uh, something that US universities are doing a lot better is. I think Howard did this actually taking students to Nigeria, to Ibadan or University, our lower uh, university. So, I mean, yeah, yeah I think it's probably generally a good thing. I, I was there. So we're doing was... that now for Swahili. Actually, we send our students to Zanzibar and Kenya, and they're there for the whole year. And when they come back, they're co they're normally quite fluent. So I've got something here from Hilary Mbane. Ah, Hilary, Hilary Mbanenande, and uh, so she's from Rwanda. I mean, her parents, see, that's the difference. Her parents are from Rwanda, but so she was raised here, and they successfully taught her Kenya Rwanda, so she's fluent in her parents' uh, language. However, she's thinking of the whole idea of mother tongues in, in relation to colonizers' languages. And she's talking about Bongugi Wathiongo and how they, they, they Bongugi versus Chinua Achebe, of how, um, English has become an African language in itself. And uh, this is actually crucial for the independence movement throughout Africa. What are your thoughts on this? Maybe we could end on this, um, uh, the thought of Africa as, uh, as an African, of, of English as an African language. Yes, so as uh, maybe I mean, your English I mean, or, or Swanglish or something, I mean, Swahili I mean, English. I was being distracted by that conversation going on in the chat. I was <laughs> listening to you coming and I was looking at her comments and I was like, oh my goodness. Yeah, uh, yes, Ngugi. And again, I, 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 I'm saying in my lane, not being a linguist, but obviously coming from um, languages and cultures of Africa, previous department of languages and cultures of Africa, as well as and then film and media studies, um, we were kind of, obviously, we have the different languages, but thinking about um, language and therefore culture is dynamic. So the idea that um, even if we have, uh, an, whether it's English or French, but how is it that it's been on the, uh, the continent for a certain amount of time and how has it changed? So I'm coming, obviously, from a, a, a standpoint of having this one language, there are no choices. It is the language of the, the one who enslaved us, but how we've taken that language and we've transformed it um, into something else. So I know decades ago, uh, some um, African-American academics were calling it Ebonics. Um, and then we think about American anthropology and even connecting whatever retentions that we have in America to southwestern Nigeria and other parts of West Africa was done through language of studying um, the language patterns of Black people in the American South and hearing the Afrish, the the African retentions and the transformation of English into something quite distinctive. So I think if we look at the Black experience in the United States, there is an argument that's be made of how you can take a European language and it can be transformed into something yes. quite different from those of us, the descendants of slaves, who don't have Yoruba or Swahili or this, this is it, it's English or it's French, and then French becomes Creole, then English becomes some other, um, I, I saw somebody talk about Henry Louis Gates, when we think about signifying monkey, again, African-American scholars working on, you know, with Wale Shayinka to say, okay, here is the root actually um, for African Americans to get ourselves back to West Africa is through the way that we speak English. That is our yeah. linguistic connection to the continent, is that we we transform this European language into something else. So there's, I exactly. think there's something so, yeah. 
So I think, Hilary, the answer is definitely yes, there is a grayscale. And this is why we also have books like um, The Palm Wine Drink Card mm -hmm. by Tutuola. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we, we've, we have got, yes. Um, yeah. So then like, people are really enjoying your conversation, ladies. And um, maybe you might want to check. I mean, I think we've already gone on time. So, Everyone's talking to themselves. So, Great. <laughs> Maybe I will, I will, I will, I will, I will close the, the 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 session, but then we can keep on talking if you feel like it. But just to quickly remind you is that the next event will um, of this continuing the conversations will be advertised very soon. Um, it will be as interesting as today's Montre and and Kumi's conversation. Just check our ticket, our sorry, our website for the tickets and. Um, if you're interested, you could also email events at soas.ac.uk. And uh, if you'd like to discuss further, maybe we can go and carry this on to Twitter uh, with our three hashtags, SOAS, um, SOAS alumni, and we are SOAS. So we can talk some more with Dr. Kola and Aremu and Tanya and Hillary and everybody, Inessa. Um, please come on on Twitter and we can continue our conversation there. Thank you so much for this fantastic conversation. It was amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody. Bye. Asante. Thank you. All right.